economic security. I think it's a very good idea. Trouble is women are too busy taking the care of the kids and <laughs> get, bringing home the paychecks. I mean, it's very hard to get people to get politically active because it takes time. And uh, especially you have uh, you know, young women with young children, then you have you know, middle-aged women with children and elderly parents. It's, it's difficult. So um, I think uh, it would be nice if one of our presidential candidates could bring those issues to the forefront. And it's part of every one of their message. Uh, but you know, who, will, who will catch on and who can lead, who can lead that, um, I don't know. But the, um, the loss of the manufacturing base in this country is, I think, is, is a serious one and all the jobs that, that went with that. And the lip service we give to being a child-centered uh, society, you know, when we have no real uh, child care and everything is so catch as catch can and education is so uneven, you know, that it, if, if somebody could actually, you know, crystallize those problems and come up with some solutions that don't cost a lot of money, that's the other problem. We are now uh, pretty, pretty bankrupt, <laughs> probably for the next generation. I mean, the, the, uh, it's a, a stunning loss of wealth from the uh, from I think it was a $3 trillion surplus, which was always a bit of an illusion, but to now a very real uh, deficit. And uh, you know, even, if, even if, if, if things don't get worse, I mean, if they don't come back for more money for Iraq and if the economy does recover, you're still looking at deficits that continue pretty far out. Um, and they haven't yet come, I mean, they, they complain about it in Washington, but nobody is willing to really yet take it on seriously. I mean, they're adopting the uh, sort of the Reagan attitude. Reagan used to say the deficits are big enough to take care of themselves. Um, no, <laughs> neither party really wants to embrace deficit reduction and, uh, and getting a really responsible hold on the, on, the, on the budget because it's seen as a loser politically. than most other states. We're one of the few states that uh, has not successfully elected a woman governor or a woman to Congress, either in the House or in the Senate. And uh, this, this vexes me. I, mean, I, I wonder mm -hmm. about it. I think, uh, does it have to do with the rural demography? Does it have to do with religious roots? Uh, what, what seems to be the problem? And I, I, I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about yeah. that type of initiative. Yeah, he's wondering why Iowa is one of the few states that hasn't sent a female to uh, either the Congress or elected a female governor. Now, I, I have to point out, Hillary Clinton was the first woman to be elected statewide from the state of New York, which is considered one of the most progressive states. In New York, I used to explain it by uh, that politics is still really important in New York. <laughs> the guys don't really want to surrender their grip on it. And Massachusetts, Massachusetts until, uh, and actually not since Margaret Heckler, I don't think Massachusetts hasn't sent a woman to Washington. Uh, and they take their politics seriously in Massachusetts as well. Now, I don't know what the, what the situation here is. Maybe it is kind of the, the frontier mentality a holdover from that, that you know the men are the hunter-gatherers and the women are the nurturers, and it's a kind of a violation of roles. Um, but you know, but whatever it is, um, you know, still even the states that have done it, with the exception, I guess, California, Washington State, and Maine, each have two uh, female senators. I don't know what, the, I guess those three states, what they would have in common is they all have sort of progressive politics. And, uh, but It'll, it's going to happen someday. <laughs> That's one thing you can predict with certainty. <laughs> Well, in, uh, she's, she's wondering if we could, quote, bust right into the presidency or if there's an interim step as vice president. In, in, the, in our book, Madam President, we do suggest that the most likely scenario is uh, a vice president so that the voters get accustomed to seeing a woman in the sort of the command role, although you could argue that vice presidents are sort of denigrated and so it might not necessarily uh, help. Um, 
but you know you don't hear a lot of talk about putting a woman on the ticket either and let's see if that happens in 2004 uh, I kind of doubt it will it's as though we still have a hangover from the Ferraro experience and a lot of people you know blame Ferraro for the loss of 49 states to Ronald Reagan her response is that um, it was morning in America Reagan was uh, a popular a president even though there was a, a recession at the time she said if God herself were on the ticket we would have lost <laughs> Uh, she's wondering if the influx of uh, Hispanics and Asians, to mention two groups who, who have a different attitude towards women than we have, but you're suggesting their attitude is more progressive and maybe less progressive. I mean, Hispanics are a very ma macho society, and I think Asians also. I mean, you know, women walk. Oh, yeah, that is what you're thinking. Yeah, it makes it more difficult, and it reminds me, again, of the suffrage period when great waves of immigrants were coming into this country and they they would get the vote once they became citizens but they were not allies of the suffrage movement because they came from societies again where women were supposed to be in the home and the, the, the public sphere and the private sphere were very separate and uh, th that that didn't help so um, other than Loretta Sanchez who is a member of Congress from California a very uh, spirited uh, young woman um, who is, ha, clearly has designs on statewide office out there. I, I, I won't go so far as to see her as a potential president. I don't quite know why I say that, but um, I think you, you, there are some, um, you know, Hispanic women in particular who, you know, may be running for higher office. But uh, overall, I think these, the changing demographics probably don't help the cause of women. Uh, I just heard Tom Brokaw the other day reminding us all that when uh, uh, people are covering a war, they're very careful not to telegraph movements or give details about where troops are going because that could put people at risk. Now, as a journalist, <coughs> what do you do when you find out the identity of a CIA agent? Uh -huh. do, you, do you out that person? Right. <coughs> what, what kind of ethical dilemma are you in? Right. Okay, the question is about the ethical dilemma for journalists in this uh, latest uh, little scandal that's, or mini scandal that's engulfing the, the White House about the charges that uh, administration officials uh, leaked the identity of a undercover CIA agent in order to punish her husband who had spoken out against the administration. Um, Frankly, as a journalist, if, I, I, if, if the CIA asked me not to print a name, I think I would abide by that. Uh, Bob Novak, who is the syndicated columnist who did print this woman's name, says that he was told by official channels at the CIA not to print the name, but that he was relying on a confidential source who assured him that she was not really an undercover operative. She was an analyst and that no, no sources or lives would be endangered. Now, Bob Novak is a journalist of 40 years standing in Washington. He admittedly is, uh, leans to the right and has been mostly sympathetic to the Bush administration, but he has very good sources. But I think it's really dangerous if you're relying on uh, a, a source like that who you're not going to identify and uh, I think he's really squirming, and that's why you see him on television insisting that he didn't get a call from Bush people that in the course of his normal reporting about uh, Ambassador Wilson and the whole uh, Niger yellow cake affair and all that, that he was told about that his wife had suggested the trip, implying that there was sort of nepotism involved, and Wilson was on television basically saying he was tasked at the highest levels, that Vice President Cheney had expressed interest, that George Tenet of the CIA asked him to go. 
And then suddenly you read his, it was his wife who wanted him to go, and it sort of downgraded it, which I, I believe was the intent of whoever leaked this information. But I think uh, Novak is trying to make a distinction between it being just dumped on him and him stumbling across the information as a good shoe leather reporter. I think it's a distinction without a difference. And I think uh, while President Bush has political problems here, so does the media, because now the media is going to close ranks and say, we're not identifying our sources. Uh, and the public is going to be out there saying, well, what's going on here? You know, who's a patriot? Who's doing the right thing? And, you know, the, the media, we're not all that popular with the voters either. And now they're going to see how the game is played. And it's not, it's not all that pretty, you know? I mean, people think we ought to get information and people's names should be attached to it and we should say where we get the information from. But if you limited your reporting to that, you would never learn anything in Washington. I mean, mostly everybody operates under anonymity. But this is the first, uh, you know, hint of any kind of criminal activity uh, by this administration. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's a, a political problem for them, but it's also an embarrassment for, you know, some reporters. Oh, she wants me to predict who's going to be on the ticket next year for the Democrats. Um, this is part of your show. I know, I know, I know. Um, you know, I, I guess I still think Howard Dean is the likely nominee, but I also uh, don't know whether he can sustain the momentum that he's had. The fundraising figures are going to come out in the next few days, and he will dwarf the others. I think Clark is a very interesting uh, entry, but I'm not sure he can live up to his resume. Uh, if he does, I think we could have a ticket of the two of them somehow combined if they don't bloody each other too much. If Clark fades or self-destructs, which is very possible, he's a rookie in this field and uh, he's, he, it, it's, it's really tough uh, scrutiny, then I think John Kerry has a chance to sort of revive his candidacy. I mean, I think Kerry is the rational choice for the Democrats. The problem is that he strikes no chord with the voters. There's no spontaneity there. And, you know, I think he's a very decent and competent individual, but he needs to find a personality. I mean, we're, as a society, we're, we're addicted to celebrity politics. I mean, watch the, again, watch the rise of Arnold Schwarzenegger, who <laughs> doesn't know anything about running a government uh, and has, you know, never run for elective office. And I think the voters think he's entertaining. And so if you want to invite somebody into your living room for the next four years, you, you want, you know, I'm trying to understand the psyche of the American people. I think it's, uh, it's one of the reasons Bush won in 2000. I think the voters uh, thought, uh, well, he didn't win. Well, <laughs> Gore didn't get too m enough votes. But I think it, uh, Bush's, the, Al Gore should have done a lot better, given he was running on eight years of peace and prosperity. And the reason that he didn't, I think, is because his personality. And also, I think the media did a number on him. I mean, they made him seem like a serial exaggerator. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so I guess those are my three top contenders, uh, uh, Dean, Clark, Kerry. Mm -hmm. Oh, you asked one I should get. Well, you should. You're the one who's picking. I'm, I'm not <laughs> Well, involved. I wanted to give this okay. uh, young man a chance to answer oh, questions. I have a question. Um, do you do any comparisons with uh, the British and Margaret Thatcher's rise to power? We did in the book, yes. And... Uh, from the superficial, where uh, oh, she, uh, he asked about whether we did any comparisons with Margaret Thatcher's rise to power. And we did in the book, from superficial, she had her teeth fixed, she had her hair lightened, <laughs> and they played uh, martial music whenever she entered the room to, you know, make her tough. And uh, also, it's a parliamentary system. I mean, she didn't... She didn't have to win 51% of the country. She had, you know, had, had to win over her fellow uh, party members. And she actually did that in one vote by saying, look, I'm not going to win, so vote for me as a sort of a placeholder. 
and she got a lot of uh, an unexpectedly high number of votes <laughs> that way. And uh, she uh, did very little, in fact, she did nothing to advance the agenda for women, and she didn't appoint women or anything like that, but she did a lot to advance the cause of women because when anyone says, uh, you know, wonders whether women can be tough enough, you can respond, Margaret Thatcher. I mean, it was a silly war she fought, but <laughs> over the Falklands, but it was uh, Margaret Thatcher who told the first President Bush not to go wobbly, George, in the <laughs> Gulf War. So yeah, she was. She's unique in in, in international politics. Okay, we have a young woman back here as well. Could you describe some ways, uh, in your opinion? Um, I think a, a woman running for president who has a background in education uh, would, one, could, could treat uh, the voters like a classroom and might have some communication skills. Uh, two, I think any profession other than lawyer, I think, might find a receptivity among the voters. I don't necessarily think any one field of endeavor is important over another. I think the important thing, if you really want to prepare for a, a, a career in politics, is to get involved in campaigns, is to uh, find uh, you know school boards and work in other people's campaigns, and then see if there's something you can run for yourself, and to develop a network of, of supporters. And uh, you know whether you're a, a, a teacher or a, a nurse or an engineer, or I don't think it's particularly all that relevant. Uh, we'll take one more question, and I'm gonna. I'm just gonna pick someone back there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that a woman running for like small state or a midwestern state would have the same kind of impact as a woman running for like a state or a midwestern state? Um, I think that it would be very different. I think that it would be very different. Hmm, that's a very good question. She's asking whether a woman running from a small midwestern state, like Iowa, maybe. <laughs> might have the same disadvantage as a man running from a small Midwestern state, or whether this woman would benefit from being a, a female. You know, I think women are still somewhat of a curiosity on the campaign trail, but that is getting old. It, if you stand out as a woman in a mostly male uh, field, you'll, you'll, that will give you a second look, simply because you're different. But that's all it will get. Then you got to then you got to sell yourself. And I think there are generally more hurdles out there for women, but the national parties uh, see the value of female candidates. The Republicans, because they want to get more women in there so they can uh, prove that they uh, are not uh, just a daddy party, as they've been called, but that they are sympathetic and compassionate conservatives and having more women in, in, in their fold helps that. And Democrats uh, are being called hypocrites because they rely on women's votes, and yet they don't seem to do enough to promote women in, in, in higher office. So I think both parties are under the gun. So whoever this uh, mythical woman is, she might get some help from the national parties in advancing her, her candidacy. Well, I said that would be the last question, but my colleague in the political oh. science department <laughs> promises a short question, so Jim Hunter. You can end the questioning, but I will tell you after the question, Eleanor is going to be around. She has her book on Madam President over there, which she'll, if you want to purchase a copy, she'll be glad to sign for you. We have a small uh, grouping of oh, refreshments. And I and just want to hold up. This is, the, this is what the new book on, on suffrage looks like. It's, it's called Votes for Women, and it's got a picture of an actress from the period with Votes for Women tattooed on her back. And it is a little, readable, manageable book. <laughs> and, and what will be, we didn't know about Less this. expensive. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know about this book until I picked up Eleanor today from the airport. So we will be trying to get that book uh, to Iowa well, State. Yeah, th this is a uh, galley uh, copy. It's the, the actual book will be available later this month. Amazon.com. Yeah. <laughs> so we will let Jim Hutter end the questioning, but I do want to thank you for coming. She will be around. We have a reception. Uh, you might be able to get your question to her personally. So Jim, this better be a stellar question. Okay? <laughs> the heat's on. <laughs> Since you're an expert on this, would you like to weigh in on the question of the media fair and balance? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay. <laughs>
if you look at the whole marketplace of the media, <laughs> you will find uh, whatever suits your taste. But I think the conservatives have been very successful in making the case that um, Eastern progressive uh, liberals uh, dominate the major media, and so they have now gotten at least equal time everywhere. And I think you know the right uh, dominates talk radio. Fox News has been extraordinarily successful, and Pat Buchanan, who's a colleague and a friend, says that the audience for cable television appears to be mostly you know populist uh, white conservative men, basically. And that's Fox News's primary audience, and MSNBC has been mimicking it, and CNN has tried to adopt some of, uh, uh, of uh, Fox News's um, uh, strategies as well. So I think overall, um, I think people who are progressive or liberal in their attitudes feel like they're not being represented in the media. and. I think after 9-11 that um, it was as though there was a blanket put over the media. It was the opposite reaction after Watergate, um, the media questioned everything. You know, if your mother told you so, get a second source. I mean, and every government institution was, you know, suspect. After 9-11 it was as though, you know, we took everything at face value and, and you know, I think the Bush administration took advantage of that. and. You know, politically, they were probably smart to do that, uh, but I think the media now is waking up from its long slumber, um, and uh, you know, I think we are getting more more questioning. But um, I think you know, there's there's lots out there in the media marketplace to to love and to hate, and uh, you know, I do both, and I appear I appear I do appear on on Fox. They I was telling Diane they use me whenever they need a punching bag. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, 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 I figure if I wasn't there on the occasional times that I am, then they would simply dominate the airwaves. And so, you know, that's the other thing. If you feel differently, you've got to fight back and you've got to get your voice out, out there. I think it was Fred Grandy. Was he from Iowa? Yes. <laughs> he used to say the definition of a uh, moderate was somebody who saw somebody drowning 14 feet away and threw them a 12-foot rope. I mean, they don't do enough, there's not enough passion. And so, I mean, I think, you know, if, if as we approach this election season, I think people on the left are now as angry as people on the right have been. And this could be a contest of, you know, which side gets out their core supporters. There's, there's not much left in the middle anymore. There are, there are very few swing voters, just as there are very few swing districts. I mean, people are really taking sides. And it's a 50-50 nation, so I think, you know, whatever happens is probably going to be close. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Again, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I think uh, this is not Eleanor Cliff's first visit to Iowa, but it's her first one to Ames, so thank you for welcoming her. And I think that she realizes all the uh, political interests in our state, and we're glad to have her here to uh, interpret the scene in Washington for us. Again, there's some refreshments in the back. Please help yourself. We'll have a book signing to my left. <laughs>